Hello everyone, my name is Danny, and I'll be presenting Design Considerations for Time-Modulated Injection-Locked Phase Interpolators and Rotators. This is an outline of our presentation. I'll be talking about motivation, introducing the architecture, present some simulated results, and then conclude my presentation. So let's begin with the motivation behind this work. Tens to hundreds of transceivers are densely packed into a single chip to support the aggregate bandwidth demands of nanoscale CMOS ASICs. Clocking circuits are vital in both the transmitter and the receiver side of the system to synchronize these parallel transceivers, and as a result, can be a dominant contributor to their overall power and area consumption. The PI it's an important part of the overall system as it is implemented for clock skewing or frequency offset generation when used within a PLL or a CDR. Designing a low power and compact PI can be very important to optimizing clocking architectures. The conventional PI interpolates by mixing two phases from the output of a multi-phase generator. Overall, these architectures burn a lot of power and can occupy a lot of area. On the other hand, the time-modulated PI combines all of these elements into a single injection-locked ring oscillator and interpolates by shifting the injection points of the clock. This significantly reduces the power and area of the overall circuit. So next, I will introduce the proposed phase interpolator or rotator architecture. So this is the overall block diagram of the architecture. So to begin, um, we have a clock driver at the input followed by a chain of buffers. The PI core itself is composed of an injection locked ring oscillator with a set of switches and logic to facilitate phase modulation. The digital subsystem generates the modulation pattern. The injection locked ring oscillator itself is implemented using a four stage ring oscillator. At each stage, there is a binary weighted capacitor for frequency control. At each injection point, there is an independent set of coarse phase and modulating injectors. Inside each injector, the injection strength is controlled by the AC coupling capacitor and the primary buffer. This buffer is tunable to improve PI linearity. The dummy inverters here are also implemented to maintain equal loading across all the disabled injectors. The four coarse phase injectors in combination with the four modulating injectors create the 16 coarse phase settings as shown in this diagram here. So next, I want to discuss the ILO's jitter considerations. Due to the ILO's inherent low pass jitter transfer characteristics, to minimize jitter, we want to minimize its tracking bandwidth. So here, we adjust the AC coupling capacitor size to vary the ILO's injection strength which by increasing its capacitance proportionally increases the ILO's digital tracking bandwidth. As you can see in this diagram here, by increasing the capacitance, we decrease the settling time of the output step phase response, which is equivalent to increasing the digital tracking bandwidth. So we can see from this transient plot on the right hand side that by increasing digital tracking bandwidth, we also increase the deterministic jitter of the ILO's output phase during phase modulation. Overall, the design trade-offs are summarized here in this table. Ultimately, while we can increase injection strength, which increases locking range, however, this also increases the jitter tracking bandwidth of the ILO, which ultimately leads to an increase in the deterministic jitter of its output. For our design, we want to minimize the deterministic jitter of the PI output, which in turn means a focus on the minimum injection strength 
ILO, which sacrifices locking range. So next, I want to discuss how the ILO interpolates the phase using the phase modulation patterns. The digital modulation pattern is made up of a repeating sequence of six bits, which divides each course phase setting into six fine phase steps. In combination with 16 course phase steps, this gives an, the PI a total of 96 fine phase steps, or 6.5 bits of resolution. To perform a phase modulation, we want to first choose a coarse phase injector. And then the two adjacent modulating injectors will be switched on and off in complementary of each other to perform phase modulation. The modulation patterns are clocked at half the frequency of the injection clock. So next, I want to talk about the jitter considerations of performing phase modulation. Here, we plot a fast Fourier transform of the ILO's output phase. From the phase output spectrum, we can see that the frequency of modulation performs noise shaping. As we increase the frequency of modulation, the phase noise is pushed to higher frequencies, which is then filtered by the ILO's first order low pass characteristics resulting in less output jitter. We can see this clearly in this transient waveform here of a 1010 modulating pattern in which a lower modulation frequency has a much higher deterministic jitter compared to a much higher modulation frequency. However, the big trade-off with modulation frequency is power consumption. As we double the modulation frequency, we also double the average power of the digital subcircuit. For our design, we chose a 7 GHz modulation frequency, which again is half the frequency of the ILO's injection clock. Next, I want to present some of the post-extracted similarity results of the PI. Here we show the layout of the proposed PI. Our results shown will be post-extracted simulation with transient noise enabled. At the typical process corner at 60 degrees Celsius temperature, we inject a 14 gigahertz clock into the system at 0.9 volts VDD, and the ring oscillator itself is tuned to be very close to 14 gigahertz. So let's begin by looking at the phase transient response of the PI. Here we perform a sweep of all six modulation patterns over two different course phase settings, which sums up to a total of 45 degrees of phase rotation. Note that the 000, 000 pattern and the 111-111 patterns corresponds to no modulation, hence why there is very little deterministic jitter at the output. The 000-001 patterns and the 111-110 patterns generate the most jitter, as they contain the most low-frequency components which would not be filtered out by the ILO's low-pass transfer characteristics. On the other hand, an alternating pattern of 101010 generates the least amount of jitter as they contain more high frequency components which would be filtered out by the ILO itself. Here we show the deterministic jitter of all 96 phase codes. Note that there is an approximately 0.2 picoseconds of noise floor which can be observed as random jitter. However, the deterministic jitter dominates the overall jitter performance of the PI, resulting in a total peak jitter of about 1.1 picoseconds. So next, I would like to discuss the phase rotation jitter of the PI. 
Here, we show a full 360 degrees phase rotation over all 96 phase codes. Each phase is stepped every 4 nanoseconds to ensure adequate time to settle. This linear sweep of the clock results in an approximately 200 ppm of frequency offset at 14 gigahertz. The blue plot here shows the simulated data, while the yellow dotted line is the ideal linear phase sweep. So here we define the phase rotation jitter as the difference between the ideal phase during phase rotation and the actual outputted phase of the PI when used as a phase rotator. The rotation jitter is plotted on the left here over different modulation schemes. At higher PPM offsets, modulation codes with high deterministic jitter, such as the 0001 codes, can be skipped to minimize jitter. This is because at high PPM frequency offsets, the phase rotation benefits from the ILO's low-pass phase soothing property, which filters out more of the high-frequency phase noise. However, at low PPM frequency offsets, by skipping modulation codes, we increase the quantization error, which dominates the output phase rotation jitter. Next, I would like to show the linearity results of the PI and discuss the calibration mechanism, which we can use to improve linearity. As mentioned earlier, each phase injector is implemented with a tunable inverter buffer as shown here. These buffers are designed with source degenerated transistors along with a 2-bit DAC, which controls the current flowing through the output of the inverter to adjust the injection strength of the clock going into the ring oscillator. Each injector can be individually controlled to fine-tune their injection strength. When two adjacent injectors are modulating with different injection strengths, the influence of the injector with the greater injection strength will be higher. Thus, the output phase will be pulled closer to the phase of that injector. After calibration, each specific phase code is programmed with its own set of DAC settings across the eight injectors and dynamically changed as the phase rotates. Here we present the INL and DNL of the PI, simulated at the typical corner at 60 degrees Celsius. While the transient noise is enabled, however, there is no mismatch introduced to the system. Looking at the INL plot, we see that post-calibration, there is a 41% improvement in the INL. Next, I would like to present the comparison table to compare RPI with some of the previous PI shown in the literature. Overall, our work operates at the fastest frequency with the highest locking range in comparison to the other time-modulated PI architectures showing the benefits of technology scaling. While jitter and linearity aren't as competitive compared to the more recent ILO-based architectures, our PI features a much lower area and power consumption. Ultimately, this design is good for dense IO applications that doesn't require stringent jitter requirements. Finally, I would like to conclude my presentation. Time-modulated ILO-based PI is a low-area, low-power design that performs phase mixing by modulating in between neighboring coarse phase injection points. Time modulation shapes the jitter to higher frequencies, which can then be filtered by the ILO's inherent low-pass jitter transfer characteristics. The locking range widens as we strengthen the injection strength, but the increase in jitter bandwidth results in increasing output deterministic jitter during time modulation. Finally, I would like to thank NSERC and Huawei Canada for their financial contribution to this project. Thank you for your time.